Well, good evening. Anybody here excited about the Lord? Oh, praise the Lord. Can't wait for the rapture. I don't know about you. I just can't wait. In fact, you know, when I teach on the rapture, I always thought it would be a great sermon illustration for it to happen right in the middle of it. Amen? You know, I like teaching these kind of things. I remember I was teaching in Houston, Texas on apologetics, and I was coming down off the platform after the session. And uh, I always like to talk to people, you know, and, uh, and uh, to interact with them. And these two sisters came up to me. Uh, this was in Texas. They had their little cowboy hats on, and uh, th they smiled just the same. I mean, you could tell that they were sisters. And so the first sister comes up to me, and she says, uh, she says, you know, Ron, I'm so glad I came. Your words were like water to a drowning woman. Now, I think that she meant to compliment me, but I wasn't sure. So I said, why, isn't that just great? But then the sister hopped in, and the sister said, oh, yes, Ron, why, you know, your, your words tonight were absolutely superfluous, just absolutely superfluous. <laughs> So I'm thinking, maybe this is a genetic thing. You know? <laughs> maybe in their family, when they want to say something nice, there's a short circuit of some kind. And, and they say something that's not so nice. So then the first sister says to me, she says, Ron, do you plan on publishing your sermons posthumously? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I've never thought about that. <laughs> but why not? And so I said, uh, I think I will. And then the other sister says, good, good, the sooner the better. <laughs> and by this time, they're both laughing. And I'm saying, uh, you know, what's going on with you two? And they said, oh, Ron, we have to confess. You know, we heard these lines on a comedy radio show, and we just had to try them out on a real human. <laughs> so I was the guinea pig. I don't listen to comedy radio, so I'm not, I'm not up on all these uh, you know, jokes and everything. But uh, be that as it may, my prayer tonight is that this session will not seem like water to a drowning woman. Okay? <laughs> Actually, we're going to be talking about some uh, very important issues, the key differences between Mormonism and biblical Christianity. And, and I know that there's more Mormons in this part of the country than in other parts, but uh, where I live in Texas, we get regular visitations on the doorstep. And so this is something that's really important for all of us to be aware of. Uh, not just in terms of our neighbors and the people that stop through the neighborhood, but there's some very famous Mormons out there, too. Uh, for example, President Hinckley, the late President Hinckley, was often on the Larry King show. I'm sure that you've seen him, just as I have. And he attained a very high visibility, and I always took notes, you know, when that guy was on. Uh, Mitt Romney, of course, is a very famous Mormon, not just in terms of uh, the political world, uh, but also in the business community. Uh, if you watch American Idol... Uh, David Archuleta and Brooke White are both Mormons, and uh, you know they ran into some controversy as a result of that during the competition. Of course, Donnie Marie Osmond are some of the most famous of Mormons out there. Uh, of course, our heart goes out to Marie with the recent loss of her son. Uh, you know, even if we are separated theologically from them, uh, boy, I pray for people when they lose a son or, or a daughter. There's nothing like that. And so, uh, in any event. Uh, uh, business people writing books that sell 15 million copies. My goodness. I wonder what that feels like. 15 million copies, one book. The point is, is that the Mormons have made many contributions, and I think it's important that, uh, that we at least acknowledge that. Uh, Mormons have been involved in uh, various things like business and politics and humanitarian causes and showbiz and just a lot of other things that they really contributed to society in, their friendliness is also commendable. I mean, whenever they stop by my house, they're always very friendly. And so I always enjoy the chats that we have together. And uh, I also have some very close Mormon uh, friends that, uh, you know, we, we chat a lot about these things. And it really breaks my heart, you know, sometimes. It really does. I mean, if you have the love of Jesus in your heart, isn't the biggest thing you want to do is to share that with people? Uh, it's, not, it's not like just a bunch of theology, but, but a living person, the Lord Jesus. That's who they need to meet. And so, uh, you know, that's what I try to do when I talk to Mormons. But you see, the biggest thing that I want to communicate to you is, is that despite all of the great things that Mormons have done, uh, the fact is, is that there are substantive differences between what we believe as Christians and what Mormons believe. And you see, my concern is that the Mormons that I know, the Mormons that you know, will not go to the heaven that we know, the heaven that we look forward to. And so that's something to keep in mind. 
you know, Mormons talk about Scripture and God and Jesus and salvation and the church and the afterlife and just a bunch of other stuff. But the thing is, is that even though they use the same words we do, they pour different meanings into those words. And, uh, you know, if you didn't know any better, you might think you agree on some stuff until you, until you start to define your words. And uh, once you find out what Mormons believe about some of these things, that's when the distinctions really start to come into play here. Uh, the real point is, is that if theological terms are defined differently, then the Christianity of the historic Christian church is not the same as the Christianity of Mormonism. Amen? And so if you've got a counterfeit uh, Jesus who's preaching a counterfeit gospel, what do you have left? Counterfeit salvation, which is no salvation at all. And so it's a very important issue that, uh, that, that we meet this weekend. And uh, you've got some of the greatest experts in Mormonism here this weekend. Uh, I mean, I'm in the fan club of all of them. I really am. They've all done tremendous work. And I hope you're able to not just uh, go to their sessions, but pick up their tapes. I certainly commend the pastors of this church for, uh, for handling this. I've got to tell you that so many churches out there don't bother doing stuff like this. Can you believe it? There's a lot of seminaries that don't even teach on this stuff anymore. And so the fact that you've got a pastor here and a pastoral team that uh, ha has brought this together is truly commendable. And I do want to thank them for that. The doctrines we're talking about tonight are not minor doctrines. You know, it'd be one thing if we were just talking about, uh, you know, the different styles of music. You know, some people like a full band. Other people like a piano. Some people just like the guitar. Uh, but this is not non-essentials that we're talking about. We're talking about the essentials of Christianity such that if you deny them, you have actually crossed outside of Christianity. Does that make sense? And, and that's, that's why it's so critical to reach Mormons because even though they sound Christian by the words that they use, uh, the truth of the matter is that it's a redefined Christianity. It's a different Jesus and a different God and a different gospel. Uh, my motivation uh, is several fold. The commitment to love and a commitment to correct doctrine. And I want to begin with that tonight. Uh, I love Mormons. I love Mormons. Uh, a lot of people uh, want to call the, uh, the hospital a psychiatric ward and bring in the men with the white coats when you say stuff like that. But the truth is, I love Mormons. I love Jehovah's Witnesses. I love Muslims. And, and I'm trying to reach these people with the love of Jesus that fills my heart. You see, I'm just this frumpy middle-aged guy, and, and I'm nothing special, but I, I represent a real special Savior. He is a savior that brings salvation as a free gift for people. And everybody needs to hear about that. And so I'm motivated by love. But you know what? Love means caring enough to tell the truth. That's tough love. When you're talking about love, you know, if I, if I see somebody that's only got a week to live, and I do not share the good news with them, and then they die, have I been loving? No, I have not. See, the most loving thing that I can do is to tell the truth in the name of Jesus. And so I am motivated by this love. Sometimes people might get angry at you for doing that, but I always ask what uh, we, we find in Galatians 4.16, have I become your enemy by, by telling you the truth? You know, I'm no one's enemy. I love people, and that's why I seek to communicate with them. I'm also not an anti-Mormon. Sometimes I get this. Uh, I'm a nice guy, really. Uh, I'm, I'm happily married. I've got two wonderful children. Uh, I've got two great cats. You know, it's a happy family. <laughs> And I'm not an anti-Mormon. I am pro-Mormon in the sense that I want Mormons to know the truth about the gospel. And so to call me an anti-Mormon, I believe, when I'm motivated by love, I believe it's really kind of borders on bearing false witness. And so here's the deal. When a Mormon shows up on my doorstep and uh, wants to share with me what's on his heart, I'm not going to call him an anti-Christian. Okay? I'm not going to do that. But I hope that he follows the golden rule by not calling me an anti-Mormon, because I'm not an anti-Mormon. I'm a pro-Mormon in the sense that I want them to know the truth, and I really want to see them in heaven. It breaks my heart to, to meet certain people that I doubt that I'll see in heaven when I get there. And let's face it, folks, you know, we don't have that much time on this planet, right? I mean, you blink three times and your hair's falling out, you see. <laughs> We're growing older before, before our very eyes. And I've got one of those bathroom lights that really shows it up very clearly. And then a commitment to correct doctrine. This is something that is not popular today, but you know what? Correct doctrine is so critically important. Uh, you know, Philip Yancey said recently, if God consistently sent lightning bolts in response to incorrect doctrine, our planet would sparkle nightly like a Christmas tree. <laughs> I think he's probably right. 
I think he's probably right about that because we've got so much heresy floating around on planet Earth out there. Certainly, doctrine is very important to God himself. It's not a secondary issue. Uh, you remember when Jesus was talking to the seven churches of Asia Minor in the book of Revelation? He gets real uh, close to them and tells them what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. And uh, you know, he, he uh, starts talking to this Ephesian church and listen to what he says to them. Out of everything that he could have said to them, listen to what he says. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You see, out of all the stuff he could have, could have said to them, he zeroed in and commended them on standing for the truth. This is incredibly important to Jesus. By contrast, Jesus criticizes a church that doesn't stand for truth. He says, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants. What's wrong with you guys? Why aren't you standing for the truth in the midst of this heresy? that's permeating your culture. Boy, that can be convicting. See, Jesus knows what's going on in every church. He also knows what's going on in every life. He cares very much about doctrine. Paul does too in the New Testament. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourselves and your hearers. You know, it's, it's a very important matter. Likewise, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine, Titus 2.1 says. It's not an option. This is emphatic in the original Greek. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to talk about sound doctrine, but it's going to be motivated by love. Amen? I mean, it's not just about the answers. It's also about the right attitude. And if Jesus is not shining through your life, you can have all the right answers in the world, and you're not going to reach people for Christ. I found that out the hard way. You see, I used to win every argument on the doorstep, but I never won them to the Lord. I now call that the flamethrower approach to evangelism. <laughs> I roasted them on the doorstep, but I didn't win any of them. But if they see Jesus shining through you, it becomes a different matter altogether. Now, the primary focus tonight uh, will be the following areas. We're going to talk about Scripture briefly, uh, the church and the priesthoods, God, Jesus Christ, man, sin, salvation, and the afterlife. Uh, you know, that's a lot to cover uh, in less than an hour. And so we're going to be brief. And as we cover this, there's a couple of qualifications. First of all, there are time restraints. You see, it's like me to go hour upon hour upon hour. I, I could easily do that. But my wife, Carrie, always tells me, Ron, get them out on time. You probably like my wife, Carrie, by now, right? Okay. <laughs> you know, the thing is, is that we can't cover all the differences that separate us, nor, nor can I give you every apologetic answer. There's just not time for this. I mean, I teach the advanced graduate courses on this stuff that takes, you know, months and months. But what we're going to do is hit the high points tonight. Another qualification, I need to tell you that Mormons don't have identical views with each other on a lot of stuff. I, you know, uh, the fact is, is that even Mormon leaders and Mormon professors have different viewpoints on things, and so it's a little bit hard sometimes to talk about this. Uh, but the fact is, is that I'm going to talk about stuff that's held by a large majority, or at least a large representative sampling of Mormons, uh, as represented in their prophets and their apostles and so forth. And uh, for that reason, here's what I always do. I never tell a Mormon what they believe. I ask them what they believe. Okay? After they tell me what they believe, then I can adapt my apologetic strategy. Does that sound wise? I mean, that's a good way to do it. Ask them what they believe. If you find out they're a mainstream Mormon, then you can treat them in that way and, and, uh, and, and, and adapt your strategy. If you find out they believe something else, then you can act accordingly and adapt your strategy. Now, let's talk about Scripture first. Uh, first, look at this, this little chart that kind of uh, gives us an overview. Uh, the Mormon view is that they do use the Bible, but they add other Scriptures, the Book of Mormon being the most important. And uh, as far as the Bible is concerned, they do believe that the Bible has transmissional errors. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the, uh, the evangelical Christian view uh, is that only Scripture is the Bible. The Bible is the only Word of God. The Book of Mormon is not the Word of God. The Bible is also inerrant, and it's also got solid manuscript support. I mean, we've got so much manuscript support that the claim that it's got transmissional errors is impossible. I'm going to show you about that just a little bit later. Uh, just briefly, historically, you might remember that Smith had gone to bed. This is Joseph Smith. He had gone to bed praying, and then an angel appeared to him, and informed him of gold plates and seer stones uh, buried at Hill Cumorah. And uh, he translated the Book of Mormon from golden plates 
and he did so by means of these seer stones, and finally the Book of Mormon was published in 1830. That's about all the history I can really give you. But Smith did say, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth, the keystone of our religion, and a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. He also said it contains the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, the test of truth is the burning in the bosom. Uh, Behold, I say unto you that you must study it out in your mind, and then you must ask me if it be right, and if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. Uh, as I said, as for the Bible, the Bible is the word of God, but only insofar as it is translated correctly. Now, they use the King James Version. They say there's been faulty transmission, large portions lost, errors introduced by unscrupulous scribes. And just listen to what Orson Pratt says. Who in his right mind could for one moment suppose the Bible in its present form to be a perfect guide? Who knows that even one verse of the Bible has escaped pollution? So that's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? You know, that's a pretty strong statement. And of course, it becomes understandable why he would say that statement because uh, he's really in favor of the Book of Mormon. Uh, many plain and precious parts of the gospel were, remo were removed by devious individuals, we are told. And many passages and even whole books of scripture have been lost through the carelessness or wickedness of the record keepers, according to Bruce McConkie. So the Bible's not looking so good, is it? It's not looking so good, not so far. Uh, of course, Joseph Smith uh, came up with the inspired version. Uh, McConkie claimed that at the command of the Lord and while acting under the spirit of revelation, the prophet corrected, revised, altered, added to, and deleted from the King James Version of the Bible to form what is now called the inspired version. And McConkie uh, admits that many thousands of changes were made. And, uh, you know, that, that's a, of concern, I think. We'll talk about that more. Uh, Smith also prophesied himself in the inspired version. Uh, Genesis 50, verse 33. I'm not going to read this entire insertion, but the important words are in yellow. God says, And that seer will I bless, and his name shall be called Joseph. His hand shall bring my people unto salvation. Now, evangelical Christians find this very curious. Very curious indeed, you know, to prophesy about yourself. Uh, this is something that I've talked to some of my Mormon friends about, and even some of the Mormon friends that I have, they also find it curious. And so uh, I think that this is something that does not work in favor of, of the Mormon belief system. Also, uh, you know, the Joseph Smith did this in a very short period of time. And the reason I make this point is that it took a large uh, group of the, the world's you know, best scholars in the Hebrew and Greek, year after year after year, working on the King James Version. And it took Smith only three years, despite the fact that he had no knowledge of Hebrew and Greek. Evangelicals also find that curious. You know, how could that be? And so these are some of the kinds of things that have come up in discussion uh, around my house. What I want to do now briefly in answer to uh, what they say about scriptures, just to give you seven brief points, and then we'll fly on to the next topic. First of all, relying on a burning in the bosom is unwise. Uh, you know what? Our feelings and our hearts are deceitful. Um, we're using damaged goods. Could I put it that way? We're using buggy software in our computer, okay? Buggy, buggy software, according to scripture. And we can't trust what our feelings tell us. Did you know, you know, I, I've studied almost every cult out there in world religion. Did you know that very often these guys base their beliefs in these different religions on their feelings? You know, I mean, these people could claim the same thing as the Mormons do, a burning in the bosom. A burning in the bosom doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove anything. 2 Timothy 2.15 says that we must study to show ourselves approved. Now, how do you study? Your head. You use your mind. God gave you a mind when he created you. And you are to study to show yourselves approved. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says we are to test all things. And we are to be like the Bereans and test all things against Scripture. Whenever Paul said something, the Bereans tested it against the Word of God. So it's not a heart thing. You know, I'm not denying that the heart's involved in our religion. I mean, we, we praise and worship God with our heart, right? But as a test for truth, a burning in the bosom is not a test. God gave us a mind so that we could understand his revelation and evaluate it. Uh, secondly, there have been many changes in the Book of Mormon. Uh, in fact, 3,913 changes were made between the original 1830 edition and those issued through the mid-1970s. And then in the 1981 edition, had over 100 additional changes. Uh, you know, obviously some of these were spelling and grammar, but some were substantial. I give you an example right here. First Nephi 11:21. Behold the Lamb of God, 
yea, even the eternal Father, is changed to, behold the Lamb of God, yea, even the Son of the eternal Father. I mean, that's a pretty big change when you think about it. And so uh, I, I have a little bit of problem here because of the way this was translated, at least according to their history. Uh, David Whitmer describes the process this way. Joseph Smith would put the seer stone into a hat. One character at a time would appear, and under it was the interpretation in English. Brother Joseph would read off the English to Oliver Cowdery. When it was written down and repeated to Brother Joseph to see if it was correct, then it would disappear, and another character with the interpretation would appear. That means one letter at a time was given. One letter at a time. That really doesn't allow for any mistakes. This kind of a process doesn't allow for any mistakes whatsoever, not even misspellings. And uh, the fact is, is that there's been virtually thousands of mistakes. And so the problem becomes this. Uh, what do you do with the Book of Mormon if it claims to have been in, originally inerrant and yet you've had multiple thousands of changes made? To me, that spells doom. We don't find that in the Bible. Uh, number three, plagiarisms in the Book of Mormon. You know, sometimes it can be hard when I'm talking to my friends that I love who are in Mormonism uh, because you don't want to share all bad news. But once you develop a good relationship with them and, and they know that you care, you need to share this stuff with them. The fact is that there's massive plagiarisms from the King James Version. Virtually tens of thousands of words taken right out of the King James Version. Uh, in fact, we might even say that uh, somewhere around a fifth of the, of the uh, Book of Mormon is right out of the King James Version. And here's the thing. It's not only got whole chapters from Isaiah, but it's also got the italicized words from the King James. Now, the italicized words are the words inserted by the King James translators to make for smoother reading. And here's the thing. Even though the Book of Mormon was translated in the 1800s, the golden plates were actually something that predated the King James Version by a long, long time. How come we've got perfect King James English, including the italicized words from the translators, in the Book of Mormon? I mean, it doesn't look good. I mean, it appears to be a very direct plagiarism from the King James Version. Furthermore, there's the issue of archaeological support. I'm fully aware of the fact that some Mormons claim, uh, you know, that there's certain things in Central America that, uh, that prove Mormonism, but, you know, they don't have the kind of support that the Bible has, and I don't think that the support they think they have really exists. Uh, we've got over 25,000 discoveries that support the Bible, and many of those are made by non-Christian archaeologists. Can you see the significance of that? It's not as if we've got a bunch of Christian archaeologists making discoveries that support Christianity. We've even got secular archaeologists making discoveries that support the truth of the Bible, over 25,000 of them. And so the archaeology is very much a friend of the Bible. For example, we've discovered Jacob's Well, where Jesus spoke with the Samaritan woman. We've discovered the Pool of Bethesda, where Jesus healed the paralyzed man. We've discovered Lazarus' tomb in Bethany. We've discovered the bone box of Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest. We've discovered the lime box containing the bones of James, half-brother of Jesus. And right on the box it says, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And we've discovered Jesus' tomb. I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. 25,000 discoveries like this that prove the veracity of the Christian Bible. Boy, that's a book I want to believe in. And it's got that kind of support. Number five, manuscript discoveries support the Bible. Now, my friends, I've done a lot of study in this. Uh, I had four semesters of Greek in college, and then I had eight semesters of Greek at, at seminary, seminary level. Got a lot of Greek. Did a lot of study in manuscripts, and I could tell you, the Bible has solid manuscript support. It really does. I've just mentioned a couple here. You know, you've got the Chester Beatty papyruses, which date to, to around 200 and earlier. And when you've got manuscripts that date that early, uh, what that means is that the Bible that you are holding in your hand today is a trustworthy document, because we've got the manuscripts that go back very near the times on which the events uh, record and prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that what we have is accurate. Even the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered in 1947, proved the same thing. They gave us manuscripts that were a thousand years earlier, and you know what? Uh, it was 95% identical with our other manuscripts dated a thousand years later. 95% identical, and the 5% difference was misspellings and missing letters on occasion. So you can trust your Bible, folks, and the Book of Mormon cannot make that claim. Uh, in terms of the inspired version, the revisions disagree with the same insertions into the Book of Mormon. In other words, when Smith made revisions to the King James Version and changed individual verses, those same verses that are repeated, basically, and plagiarized into the Book of Mormon do not reflect what Joseph Smith did. And so who's right? 
Joseph Smith or the Book of Mormon? You know, is the inspired version wrong? Or is the Book of Mormon wrong? Or are they both wrong? Well, you know where I'm coming from. The fact is, is that if you've got a false book, it affects everything. And that's one of the points that I want to make to you today. If you've got a book that's not truly scripture, and that's going to affect everything else that you believe in a negative way. You see, that's why I spend so much time talking to Mormons about the, the trustworthiness of the Bible. I also bring up the book of Revelation to make a point. Revelation 19.15 in the King James Version says, Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it it should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. But Smith changed it to say, Out of his mouth proceedeth the word of God, and with it he will smite the nations, and he will rule them with the word of his mouth. Now why do I bring it up? I bring it up because in Revelation 22 it says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes the words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. You see how serious it is? This is really, really serious. And this is what motivates me to talk to Mormons. I don't want them to miss out. I don't want them to miss out on heaven. And some of them, are, they're just so sincere in what they believe, but they've been deceived. And that means that you and I got to do double duty to reach them. Now, evangelicals they trust the Bible alone. Uh, I'm one of them. Uh, there's not only massive manuscript evidence that supports the Bible and massive archaeological evidence, but it's also written by prophets and apostles whose prophetic predictions had 100% accuracy. Amen. Uh, we've got all the prophecies in the Old Testament, for example, that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. You know, uh, to be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. Born from the line of Abraham, Genesis 12. From the line of David, 2 Samuel 7. Pierced for our sins, Zechariah 12, 10. I mean, on and on. Born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. You see, the Bible very specifically gives these prophecies that were fulfilled absolutely to the, the crossing of the T and the dotting of the I. But the, the Mormon prophecies, do they have a similar track record? No, not if you look at what Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and these other guys prophesied. The prophecies did not come true. Now, let's switch attention to the church and the priesthoods because this is a natural progression. It's, it's, it's logical that we cover this next. Uh, Mormons believe that total apostasy engulfed the church soon after the death of the last apostle. They believe it's prophesied in Scripture, and because of that apostasy, church offices were lost and the gospel was lost, and the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods were lost as well. And so a lot was lost. Now, if they're right about that, then we do need a restoration. But the question is, was there really an apostasy like they say? We'll talk about that. Uh, the Mormon church emerges back in 1830, and uh, the Aaronic priesthood was conferred on Joseph Smith and Oliver Cattery by John the Baptist. And then the biblical Peter, James, and John later conferred the Melchizedek priesthood on them. Although evangelicals find it extremely curious that the biblical Peter, James, and John never had the Melchizedek priesthood. Uh, so that, that's an interesting thing. Uh, the Mormon church is claimed to be the restored church, restoring the priesthoods, restoring the prophets and the apostles, and restoring the true gospel. Now here's what this means, folks. If this is true, then it's the only true church on earth. If they've got the true priesthood, the prophets and the apostles, and the true gospel, then it's the only true church on earth. Calvary Chapel, you've lost it, babe. You, you've lost it. Your pastor has misled you, okay? Ron Rhodes is a quack. He's an absolute quack walking around. But are they right? Are they right? I don't think that they are. Let me tell you why I don't think that they are. First of all, uh, we have a very accurate history of the early Christian church. I mean, we've got such an accurate history of the early Christian church. Uh, we have a uh, uh, full knowledge of all the isms that existed back then. You know, Arianism and Gnosticism and Eutychianism and Apollinarianism and, you know, modalism and monarchianism, just all those isms. Yes, I've studied all of those isms, every one of them. But I want you to know that my wife, Carrie, makes me read two Christian books for every weird book that I read. So I'm safe. I'm safe. It's good to have a good wife, amen? All right. Well, you know, the fact is, is that when you look at the first century history in the church, we don't see anything resembling Mormonism. If it's true that the Mormon church is a restored church, then we would expect to see back in the first century stuff, you know, a church, stuff like the plurality of gods and men becoming gods and the father once having been a man. There's none of that there. None of that there. And so history is on the side of Christianity. History proves that there was no uh, you know, restored church or, or need for a restoration. What about the verses that they cite? 
Uh, Galatians 1, 6 to 8 is one example. I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Now, where is there any mention of a total apostasy of the entire church in this verse? It's not there. It is not there, my friends. Uh, this is dealing with a local situation in Galatia. Galatia alone. Paul wrote the letter to Galatia alone. And guess what? After Paul wrote the letter to Galatia alone, the problem was solved. The guys repented. Okay? And, and so the fact is, is, this has nothing to do with a total apostasy of the early Christian church, such that a restoration was needed. Well, what about 2 Thessalonians 2? Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. And so Mormons think this refers to this total apostasy that we're talking about, but I don't think so. I mean, when you look at the context, what's going on here? This is talking about a specific distinguishable apostasy that's in the end times. It hasn't happened yet. It's right before the second coming, and it comes when the Antichrist is revealed. That hasn't happened yet, you see. And so to quote something that's in the prophetic future as having already been fulfilled, that's kind of like Mormon preterism or something. I'm not sure how that works. But the fact is, is that this is talking about the end times. It's not talking about something in the first century. And so really what we have here is eisegesis, or reading something into the text that is not really there. Uh, and then number four, promises to the church. Uh, who created the church? Anyone? Jesus. Absolutely. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Now, what does that mean? First of all, building the church is his job. If it's his job, does Jesus fail? No, Jesus never fails. In fact, one of the things that you see interesting throughout the New Testament is Jesus' providential control over the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. He is the one who's in charge of building it. And it did not fall into total apostasy in the early centuries of Christianity. It just didn't. Jesus promised the gates of hell will not stand against it. Uh, Jesus also said, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, wait a minute. The end of the age wasn't the first century. Okay? End of the age. It hasn't even happened yet. But Jesus said he was going to be with his believers in the church until the very end of the age. But how could, how could that be true if everybody went into total apostasy? It doesn't fit. The pattern in the New Testament is that Jesus is sovereign over the church. That's why we read in Ephesians 3.21, to him or God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And then Ephesians 4 speaks of the Christian church's growing to spiritual maturity, not spiritual degeneracy. Oh, I wish I could spend another half hour with you on this, but I can't. I've got to move on. But you can see the kind of promises that stand against this restoration church idea. What about the Melchizedek priesthood? Well, very often they cite Psalm 110 in support of their idea that the Melchizedek priesthood is for today. But you know what? Psalm 110 is a messianic psalm. And do you know what that means? It's talking about who? Jesus, the divine Messiah. Now, uh, verse 4 says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Well, guess what? All throughout the New Testament, Hebrews 5 to 8 being an example, um, the fact is, is that all these different verses in the New Testament say that this psalm is talking about Christ alone. Now, if you want to find out what Psalm 110 is talking about, doesn't it make sense to let Scripture tell you what Psalm 110 is talking about? Doesn't that make sense? Well, that's exactly what we see in the New Testament. Jesus himself quoted Psalm 110 in demonstrating that he was David's Lord in Mark 12, 36. So my point to you is, is that if you interpret Scripture by Scripture, there's no way you can end up saying that the Melchizedek priesthood uh, is applicable to human beings. Did you know that there's not a single verse anywhere in the Bible, or in the New Testament in particular, of a believer uh, being ordained to the Melchizedek priesthood? Only Jesus Christ. No disciple, no apostle, no Peter, no Paul, no John. None of those guys had the Melchizedek priesthood. Nor is there a single command anywhere in the New Testament, including the epistles. Why do I say epistles? Because that's where you'd expect it to be. That's where God gives instructions to the church. If the church was supposed to have the Melchizedek priesthood, that's exactly where it would be. But there's not a single mention anywhere, you see. It's always presented as belonging only to Jesus. Now, in Hebrews 7, 23 and 24, this passage says that there are human priests that are prevented from continuing in office because of what? Death. 
But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Oh, amen to amen. Uh, you know, the fact is, is that Jesus is our forever high priest. He can never be replaced, and his priesthood is not transferable to any human being. How do I know that? Well, for example, now if you look at the Greek behind Hebrews 7.24, we find that the Greek word for permanent means untransferable. That's what it literally means according to the best Greek lexicons we've had. And folks, remember, I've had 12 semesters of Greek. I know this to be true. I can tell you for a fact that the word carries the idea of untransferable, untransmissible. You cannot communicate it from one person to another. It belongs to Jesus alone. He alone is our high priest, and there is none other. There is none other. And we must communicate this to our, our Mormon friends. But what about the Aaronic priesthood? Well, guess what Scripture says? When the Melchizedek priesthood of Jesus Christ came into being, the Aaronic priesthood went out the back door. Out the back door. It was ushered out the back door. Hebrews 7, 11, and 12 says that there was a change in the priesthood, and when there's a change in the priesthood, the old priesthood is done away with. It has been superseded. And what that means is, is that there is no Aaronic priesthood today. And by the way, let's point out that Mormons are not descendants of Aaron. That was the number one requirement of the Aaronic priesthood. You had to be a direct descendant of Aaron. And not only that, if you look at the, study, uh, at the stuff that Mormons do who are in the Aaronic priesthood, it bears virtually no resemblance to what you see the Aaronic priests doing back in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Nor do these guys go through the kinds of uh, uh, cleansing rituals that the Aaronic priests had to go through uh, back, uh, you know, back in Old Testament times. So you see where I'm, I'm going with this. The fact is, is that all this talk about the, the Melchizedek and the Aaronic priesthoods in, in Mormonism is really not true. And I always want to communicate this in the spirit of love to my uh, Mormon friends, but it has to be communicated. Uh, you know, when I, when I talked about love, remember I talked about tough love? Love means caring enough to tell the truth. This is what I'm talking about. It's not easy to do sometimes, but we need to do it. Bottom line, there was no apostasy, no total apostasy in the early church. Scripture portrays Jesus as sustaining and upholding the church throughout history. The church thus did not need restoration. The Aaronic priesthood has passed away, and the Melchizedek priesthood belongs only to Christ and none other. This is what the scriptures reveal very, very clearly. But what about the doctrine of God? Now, this is one of those areas where I get into lots and lots of discussion uh, with, with my Mormon friends, and, and obviously, I think you know why. There's some very interesting uh, takes that, uh, that Mormons have on this. Uh, they believe that God was once a mortal man who passed through the school of earthly life. In fact, the way that Milton Hunter put it is this. God, the eternal father, was once a mortal man who passed through a school of earth life similar to that through which we are now passing. He became God, an exalted being, uh, through obedience to the same eternal gospel truths that uh, we are given opportunity today to obey. Um, is this a Mormon teaching, though? Did you see the Time Magazine article back in 1997? Some, some of you are going, oh yes, I remember that. Uh, uh, got a very good memory. Well, he was asked, point blank, is this the teaching of the church today that God the Father was once a man like we are? And so uh, the late Hinckley said this, I don't know that we teach it. I don't know that we emphasize it. I haven't heard it discussed for a long time in public. I don't know all the circumstances under which the statement was made. I understand the philosophical background behind it, but I don't know a lot about it. And I don't know that others know a lot about it. Well, that causes me to wonder if he's unaware of, for example, Joseph Smith saying, God himself was as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. If you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form like yourselves. He also said, we have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. Lorenzo Snow put it this way, if there ever was a thing revealed to a man perfectly, clearly, so that there could be no doubt, this was revealed to me, and it came in these words, as man now is, God once was, as God now is, man may become. So it strikes me as curious that Hinckley was aware, unaware of statements like these. I mean, these statements play such a prominent role in Mormon history. We're also told that the Father today has a tangible body of flesh and bones. As Hunter put it, God the Eternal Father, our Father in Heaven, is an exalted, perfected, and glorified personage having a tangible body of flesh and bones. Uh, Joseph Smith said, if you were to see him, the Father, today, you would see him like man in form. Uh, God the, the Eternal Father, our Father in Heaven, is an exalted, perfected, and glorified personage 
having a tangible body of flesh and bones. And there's, there's many other quotes that I could give you, but you get the point. It's a very clear teaching in Mormon history. Uh, as for the Trinity, uh, it's not three persons and one God. It's three persons who are three gods, which is called what? Tritheism. Tritheism. Uh, this is a heresy that crops up every once in a while in church history, but it's very strongly taught in Mormonism. In fact, uh, uh, you know, Joseph Smith said, I have always declared God to be a distinct personage, Jesus Christ a separate and distinct personage from God the Father, and that the Holy Ghost was a distinct personage and a spirit. And these three constitute three distinct personages and three gods. So, I mean, this is very clearly not the Trinity that, uh, that you and I believe in. Obviously, there's a plurality of gods. I don't need to, to read many quotes to you on this, but suffice it to say, uh, Brigham Young said, how many gods there are, I do not know. But there never was a time when there were not gods and worlds, and when men were not passing through the same ordeals that we are now passing through. Uh, that course has been from all eternity, and it is and will be to all eternity. And then uh, Pratt has a similar statement. So uh, it's a, a big part of Mormon history to recognize the plurality of gods, that there's not just one god, but there's many gods out there. This means also that there is endless heavenly fathers. Endless heavenly fathers. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus has a father, and the father of Jesus has a heavenly father before him, and the heavenly father of that heavenly father has a heavenly father before him, and the heavenly father of that heavenly father of that heavenly father of that heavenly father has a heavenly father before him, and so on and so forth throughout eternity. Now, there are some Mormon philosophers who have conceded that this is a huge problem and no longer believe this. You know, there are some that, uh, that have now claimed that. But nevertheless, this is such a pivotal part of, uh, of Mormon theology, it's hard to see how you could dismiss this without dismissing a whole lot of their other theology. You know, you know what I mean? I mean, it's all, it's all intricately related to, to other things. And so, uh, you know, at, at least some of them are turning around on this. Uh, Orson Pratt explained the pattern this way. Uh, in the heaven where our spirits were born, there are many gods, each one of whom has his own wife or wives, which were given to him previous to his redemption, while yet in his mortal state. Each god, through his wife or wives, raises up a numerous family of sons and daughters. As soon as each god has begotten many millions of male and female spirits, he, in connection with his sons, organizes a new world after a similar order to the one which we now inhabit, where he sends both the male and female spirits to inhabit tabernacles of flesh and bones. The inhabitants of each world are required to reverence, adore, and worship their own personal father who dwells in the heaven which they formerly inhabited. All right, that's a pretty long quote, isn't it? But that's a good summary of what many Mormons believe in terms of what has happened over and over again uh, in, throughout the universe. Now, how do we as uh, evangelical Christians respond to this? Well, there's a couple of things to point out. Um, first of all, note this comparison. Christianity teaches there's only one God, amen? Mormonism says there's many gods. Christianity teaches a trinity. Mormonism teaches tritheism. Christianity teaches that God is unchangeable. Mormonism says that change is built into God. I mean, he went from a man to godhood. Christianity says that God is pure spirit, but Mormonism says that God has a physical body. Just looking at this chart alone should show you very clearly that there are you know, magnificent differences between biblical Christianity and Mormonism. Uh, it's a clear teaching of scripture that uh, there is one God. You like my finger, that, that photograph from my... Uh, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. That's what God says. God's not just talking about, you know, this world. He's talking about all of reality. God says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Isaiah 44.6. I am the first and I am the last and apart from me there is no God. Isaiah 45, 18, I am the Lord and there is no other. I could get to preaching on this, folks. Mark 12, 29, Jesus said that the Lord is one. 1 Corinthians 8, 4, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. Ephesians 4, 6, there is one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And then 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one God. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Amen, amen. This is powerfully taught in Scripture. Moreover, God is not an exalted man, uh, Hosea 11, verse 9. I am not a man, God very clearly says. Rather, he is a spirit, John 4, 24. And guess what? Luke 24, 39 tells us that a spirit does not have flesh and bones, period. 
If God is spirit, he doesn't have flesh and bones. Scripture says he is invisible, Colossians 1.15. Even the Book of Mormon says God is that great spirit in Alma 22.10. Book of Mormon also says, We believe that thou art God, and that thou, God, was a spirit, and that thou art a spirit, and that thou wilt be a spirit forever. Now, I'm not trying to give credence to the Book of Mormon by quoting it. I just find it curious that the Book of Mormon contradicts some of the primary teachings of Mormonism. Do you? God is unchangeable, is the scriptural teaching. Numbers 23, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Uh, 1 Timothy 15, the glory of Israel is not a man. The glory of Israel is a, uh, a name for God. Psalm 102, they will perish, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. I, the Lord, do not change, God says in Malachi 3, 6. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. All these passages are talking about the fact that God is immutable, and that's a theological word that simply means that God does not change. God has always been God. He has always been God. Or let me put it in the vernacular, okay? God doesn't blossom. He's always been in full bloom. Is that a good way to put it? He's always been in full bloom. God does not blossom, period. Uh, he's also, uh, there's also a philosophical problem. I know that talking about philosophy at this time of night is not a wise thing to do. So I'm just going to sneak it in real quick. Can I sneak it in? Nobody will notice. I'll sneak it in real quick. A finite being can never become an infinite being. A finite being, philosophically, must always remain finite. Adding more to a finite, no matter how much more, only makes a bigger finite. <laughs> That's it. That is it. Philosophy 101. You cannot have the, the finite becoming infinite. It is philosophically impossible, and any philosopher that knows what he's doing will tell you that this is absolutely true. And any Mormon philosopher who honestly was telling the truth would have to admit that this is true, too. You, you, just, you just can't have this. Uh, what about Jesus Christ? This is my favorite topic of all, and I've got to sort of pick up the speed here, see that I'm running out of time. Jesus Christ is my favorite topic of all, so let me just fly through this real quick. Uh, Jesus was the first and greatest spirit son born to the Heavenly Father, one of his unnamed wives. He is the firstborn because he was begotten first. Lucifer was also begotten, so that he's the spirit brother of Lucifer. Jesus is our elder brother because we were all begotten as spirits as well. Christ was begotten on earth later by an immortal father in the same way that mortal men are begotten by mortal fathers. In other words, the father came down and had relations with Mary. Uh, Jesus became a god in the pre-existence. He became the Jehovah of the Old Testament. And uh, Jesus worked out his salvation as well. According to Bruce McConkie, Jesus kept the commandments of his Father and thereby worked out his own salvation and also set an example as to the way and the means whereby all men may be saved. As for the atonement, Christ's atonement dealt with Adam's sin, not your sin, but Adam's sin, uh, leaving us responsible for our own sins. The Mormon second article of faith affirms, we believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. Hence, salvation begins with Jesus, but man, we've got to pick up the football and run with it ourselves. Good works. We've got to do good works to get saved, according to Mormon theology. In fact, the official gospel principles manual says that Jesus became our Savior, and he did his part to help us return to our heavenly home. It is now up to each of us to do our part and become worthy of exaltation. So this is a works-oriented system of salvation. Well, how do we respond to that? Well, briefly, note this comparison. Uh, in the Christian view, Jesus is eternal, but in the Mormon view, not eternal. In the Christian view, Jesus was uncreated, but in the Mormon view, he was procreated. In the, more, in the Christian view, he's the unique son of God. In the Mormon view, he's the brother of Lucifer. In the Christian view, he has the same essence as God, but in the Mormon view, he does not have the same essence because he's a different being than the Father. Uh, in the Christian view, he is one with God, but in the Mormon view, he is a separate God. In the Christian view, there is no need of salvation for Jesus because he was sinless, but in the Mormon view, he had to earn salvation. I mean, this kind of encapsulates the basic differences between Mormons and Christians. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I don't think that Mormons can legitimately say, I'm a Christian. They may say that I believe in Jesus, but look at the Jesus they believe in. This is a different Jesus than the Jesus of the Bible. Now, my friends, the Bible talks about Jesus as the Son of God, but as the eternal Son. Did you know that among the ancients, the term Son of meant sameness of nature, lightness of nature.
The term son of the prophets meant what? Prophet. Son of the singers meant singer. Son of God meant God. Absolutely. That's why whenever the Jews heard Jesus claim to be the son of God, uh, he, they immediately picked up stones to kill him for committing blasphemy. So Jesus wasn't procreated as the son of God. He's eternally the son of God according to scripture. Uh, Psalm 2.7 doesn't really uh, add any ammo to the, the Mormon arsenal, even though they think it does. This verse says, you are my son, today I have become your father. That sounds like the father begat Jesus at first glance. But you know what? If you want to understand what Psalm 2.7 means, don't you want to let scripture tell you what it means? In Acts 13, it tells us precisely what is meant by Psalm 2.7. This verse tells us that this verse was fulfilled when Jesus resurrected from the dead by the Father. That's what is being talked about when it says, You are my son, today I have become your father. It was the resurrection from the dead. This has nothing to do with the Father and Mary. It has nothing to do with the Father bearing spirit babies. Nothing whatsoever. This is a different matter altogether. Likewise, John 3.16 is not a proof text. This is the verse that says that uh, Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. And only begotten is from the King James Version. Nothing against King James, but you know the Greek word there, monogonese, uh, it properly understood that word only means unique, one of a kind. Jesus is the unique, one of a kind Son of God. So he was not begotten by the Father in the sense that he came into being, but rather he was the Son of God in the sense that no one else is. He is God by nature. That's what the term indicates. And so very clearly, that's a misappropriation of a Bible verse. It is true that Jesus is called the firstborn. I admit that. But that doesn't mean that he was born physically or born as a spirit. It has nothing to do with that. Uh, again, if you want to talk about a word like firstborn, does it make sense to, to let the Bible tell you what it means? When you go back to the Old Testament, we find that David was called the firstborn. Was David the firstborn in his family? No, he was the lastborn son of Jesse. And yet he was called the firstborn because of his preeminence. He became king of Israel. It means preeminence. Jesus is called the firstborn of creation. What does it mean? He is preeminent over creation. Why is he preeminent over creation? The very next verse tells you. Verse 16 says he created a creation. Doesn't it make sense that he who created the creation is preeminent over it? That's all firstborn is. I'm, I shouldn't put it that way. That's a magnificent in terms of God, Christ being the firstborn. It's a magnificent understanding, and that's the truth of what Colossians is really communicating. Because Colossians is communicating that Jesus is superior in every way. What about uh, the brother of Lucifer? Uh, Jesus is not the brother of Lucifer. In fact, if you go to Colossians 1.16, it says that Jesus created the thrones and the powers and the rulers and the authorities. Jesus did it. Now, who are those thrones and powers and rulers and authorities? According to ancient rabbinical literature, that is referring specifically to angels. Christ created the angels. One minute they didn't exist, the ne next second they did. And the first sight was Jesus Christ, the creator. Christ created Lucifer. You're talking about two different classes, folks. Jesus is in the class of the creator. Lucifer is in the class of the created. They ain't the same. They're not in the same family. They ain't in the same class. We say ain't in Texas sometimes. Okay? <laughs> you just, so you just got to get used to that. We also say y'all. So y'all better behave yourselves tonight. Okay? All right, number seven, Jesus is Jehovah and Elohim. Uh, you might know that the uh, Mormons say that Jesus was the Jehovah of the Old Testament and the Father was Elohim, but you know what? Jesus uh, is both Jehovah and Elohim, and Jehovah and Elohim are one and the same God. Genesis twenty-seven twenty, Isaac tells his son, The Lord your God gave me success. From the Hebrew that says, The Lord Jehovah, your God Elohim, gave me success. Same thing in Exodus 3. Uh, I am the God, Elohim, of your father, the God, Elohim, of Abraham, the God, Elohim, of Isaac, and the God, Elohim, of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God, Elohim. The Lord Jehovah said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. And uh, then, you know, he instructed Moses on delivering his people from Egypt. Fact is, this is talking about one God. Elohim is Jehovah. What about Jeremiah 20, uh, 32? It talks about the great and powerful God, Elohim, whose name is the, the Lord Jehovah Almighty. You see, Jehovah and Elohim are one and the same. Not only that, but Jesus is called Elohim by himself, apart from the Father. Isaiah 40, verse 3, gives a prophecy of the coming of Jesus. It says this, A voice of one calling, In the desert prepare the way for the Lord, Jehovah. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God, Elohim. You know when that was fulfilled? That was fulfilled when John the Baptist prepared the way for the coming of Jesus, according to John 1.23. Look it up yourself. 
You see, so Jesus is called both Jehovah and Elohim right there in the same verse. Number eight, Jesus' is human birth. It wasn't because the Father had relations with Mary. It was because the Spirit overshadowed Mary. The human nature of Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And why do I say human nature? I say that only because Jesus was already God from all eternity. Jesus did not need any help from the Holy Spirit or from the Father in terms of being eternal God because he has always been eternal God. But the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and produced a human nature for Jesus to step out of heaven and into that womb for nine months and then was born as the God-man, you see. That's what the incarnation really is. So the Mormons have completely missed the boat on this one. What about the atonement? You know what? Jesus atoned for the sins of all humankind, not just Adam. Isaiah 53, verse 6 is a good example. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yours truly included. All of you included. See, this was not Adam's sin that Jesus died for, although Adam was included. He died for every one of us. And it was a complete atonement. When Jesus atoned for us, he didn't just buy you a resurrection from the dead. Uh, Ephesians 1, we are forgiven in Christ. Hebrews 7, we are saved in Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, we are justified or declared righteous in Christ. Ephesians 2, we are brought near in Christ. Uh, Colossians 1, we are reconciled in Christ. Romans 5, we have eternal life in Christ. Romans 6, we are made alive in Christ. Ephesians 1, we are redeemed in Christ. Man, what could be more incredible? Isn't this the greatest news you've ever heard? This is a full redemption that Christ has provided. Not just some measly resurrection from the dead. Now, I'm not knocking the resurrection. Believe me. I mean, no more gray hairs, no more cholesterol buildup, you know, no more hairs falling out. Best of all, you can still eat food. Okay? Jesus ate food after he resurrected. So I'm looking forward to that good heavenly cooking. Amen? Amen. Now then, there's a warning from Jesus. Jesus said, on that future judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Now listen to me. I don't want my Mormon friends to hear those words. I don't. I love them too much. I love Mormons too much to have this said of any of them. That's why I, I do what I do. That compassion that is within me, it's the love of Christ flowing over into the lives of other people. That is why I seek to reach them so that they can know the same Jesus that I do. Now very quickly, we're going to kick into warp nine at this point. The doctrine of man. Uh, this is very closely related to what we've already talked about in terms of uh, the plurality of gods. Remember the statement, as man is now, God once was, as God now is, so man may become. So in other words, man can become God. We can become gods like our Heavenly Father. This is exaltation, says Gospel Principles. Uh, Spencer Kimball put it this way, Man can transform himself and he must. Man has in himself the seeds of Godhood, which can germinate and grow and develop. As the acorn becomes the oak, the mortal man becomes a god. That's the way he put it. Now, what do we respond with? Well, first of all, humans do not become a god. And I cite to you Isaiah 43.10. It says this, God is speaking, and he says, Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Before and after are absolute terms in the Hebrew. Absolute terms. There will never be a God before the one true God of the universe. There will never be a God after the one true God of the universe. And no is emphatic in the Hebrew. Before me there was no God formed. There is one and only one deity. That means that you and I will never be deity. You and I are going to be in heaven one day, and that's going to be glorious, but you will never be deity. I can promise you that. Humans are finite creatures. God created man out of nothing. And it is true that God created you in the image of God, but that doesn't mean you become a god. Okay? It simply means that just as the moon reflects the light of the sun, so you, as his creation, reflect God in a finite way in terms of being a relational creature, a rational creature, and a moral creature. You see, But it doesn't mean that you become a God. So the Mormons have misunderstood that. And then number three, John 10, 34 doesn't support their viewpoint. This is that verse that says, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. That sounds like you'll become a God, doesn't it? But is that what's really going on there? Jesus is actually pointing back to Psalm 81, where human judges are called gods. 
Jesus' reasoning goes like this. If God even called human judges God with a small g, then how much more is it appropriate that I call myself the Son of God, since that truly is my identity? Or look at it this way. If these judges, because of their works of standing in the place of God by pronouncing life and death decisions over people, if they can be called gods in a limited sense with a small g, how much more appropriate that I be called the Son of God because of my works, mighty miracles? You see? So Jesus was basically... Uh, pointing out that he truly is God, whereas those folks back in Psalm 81 really weren't gods. In fact, Jesus said they're going to die uh, like the men they really are. That, that's uh, uh, verse 7 in Psalm 81. So my point to you is that this does not support the Mormon viewpoint. I might also point out to you that in the Greek, John 10:34 is a present tense. You are gods. It doesn't say you will become a god. It's present tense. And this does not fit Mormon theology because Mormons think they will become gods. Not that they are gods right now. So any way you look at it, John 10.34 does not lend support or credence to the Mormon interpretation. Now I'm going to close with sin and salvation. Sin and salvation is one of the most important things that we can uh, talk about. Uh, they've really got some strange views here, so let me cover their view first, and then I'll get into the Christian view. Uh, they say that the fall was a good thing. One of their Sunday school ma manuals put it this way. The uh, decision of Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit was not a sin, as it is sometimes considered by other Christian churches, you know, like us. It was a transgression, an act that was formally prohibited, but not inherently wrong. Their choice did not come from a desire to disobey the Lord, but from a desire to gain wisdom. Because of this choice, we have the opportunity to come to earth and learn, as Adam and Eve did, how to choose good over evil. Express your gratitude for Adam and Eve and the choice that they made. Well, that's just a horrendous departure from what we believe. I mean, we think that, you know, what did God say to Adam and Eve when they fell? What is this you have done? I mean, that's what God said to them, and it catapulted the whole human race into sin. They also teach that in Gethsemane, Christ sweat great drops of blood from every poor, uh, when he conditionally took upon himself the sins of the world, and then the shedding of his blood was completed at the cross. So that means that Gethsemane uh, played a central role in the atonement. Whereas the rest of the New Testament talks about what? The cross. The cross is where he obtained the atonement. According to them, Jesus paid the atonement for, uh, for Adam's transgression, basically, and provided a physical resurrection to all mankind. As to forgiveness of personal sins, it is taught to be conditional based upon repentance and obedience to the laws and ordinances of the LDS gospel, not LPS. I don't know how I slipped in there. Rats, I'm not an errant. Oh, man. Jesus provided general salvation, which refers to resurrection from the dead. As for individual sal salvation, you've got to work that out yourselves. As uh, James Talmadge put it, he refers to justification by belief alone as a most pernicious doctrine. He laments that the dogmas of men have been promulgated to the effect that by faith alone may salvation be attained. One must of necessity engage in perpetual works. So in other words, this idea that you, uh, you, you place your faith in Christ uh, that doesn't save you. You've got to do good works. Not just good works, but a life of good works. And prove yourself obedient. And they do talk about Matthew 5.48. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now Joseph Smith is also necessary. As Brigham Young put it, from the day that the priesthood was taken from the earth to the winding up of things, uh, every man and woman must have the certificate of Joseph Smith as a passport to their entrance into the mansion where God and Christ are. I with you and you with me. I cannot go there without his consent. So this has become sort of a Joseph Smith thing. You know, the Bible talks about it as a Jesus thing. There's only one mediator between God and man, and that's the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, based on how people do, though, uh, most people will end up in one of three kingdoms. My father-in-law asked me if one is hotter than the other. Uh, I told him that wasn't the main point. But that some people might end up in the outer darkness, you know. But in any event, depending upon how you live, you'll end up in one of three kingdoms of glory. Now, how do we respond as Christians? Biblically, sin is a horrible reality, and there's no better person to go to than Jesus of Nazareth for teaching on it. Jesus taught that man is evil, is capable of great wickedness, is utterly lost, is a sinner, in need of repentance before a holy God, and needs to be born again. Jesus gave metaphors like blindness and sickness and being enslaved and living in darkness to describe sin. He said it's universal. We're all guilty. None of us are beyond the grip of sin. Both inner thoughts and external acts make us guilty, and God is fully aware of every one of them. 
Now, whereas they say that the fall was a good thing, Jesus tells the truth about the matter. Sin is a horrific thing, and that means that we need a magnificent salvation. Now, Jesus perceived his death as being a sacrificial offering for the sins of mankind, not to win resurrection, but a full salvation. And he knew that without him, all humanity would perish. None would survive. Jesus described his mission this way. The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Who's the lost? That's you. That's me. That's the Mormons. That's the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's the Muslims. Every one of them is lost. But Jesus came to provide salvation for all. And again, I remind you that it is a full salvation with forgiveness and justification and being brought near and reconciliation. All these things are provided in the person of Jesus Christ. And glory upon glory, it is all by grace alone. It is by grace alone. Uh, by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by, not by works so that no one could boast. I love that verse. I just love it. Matthew 5.48, what's going on there? Matthew 5.48 is all about love. It does say you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, but it's talking about love. You see, the Jews said, love your neighbors but hate your enemies. Jesus said, no, no. Love your neighbors but also love your enemies. Be complete in your love for other people. Be perfect in your love for other people, just like God is. This verse has nothing to do with salvation. It's dealing with showing love to other people, and yet the Mormons have hijacked it as making a requirement for salvation. And then, let's not forget that salvation is received by faith. Over 200 times in the New Testament, it is said to be received by faith and faith alone. Not a big lifetime of works, but by faith in the risen Messiah. And we are justified by faith. And what does that mean? We're declared righteous by Jesus. If I look through a yellow glass, you all look yellow. Some of you look yellow anyway. <laughs> If I look through a red glass, you look red. When God looks at you, the Christian, he sees you through the lens of the white holiness of Jesus Christ. That's justification, and it comes by faith. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. Mormons need to hear it. Bottom line, there's only one of two destinies that await us, depending upon what we, what we do with Jesus. Two classes, saved and unsaved. Two destinies, heaven or hell. It is that simple. And it all hinges on what you do with Jesus. Now, I'm going to leave it to you with this. I'm going to close with this. The lingering question remains, can I be perfect enough to warrant salvation? Can I be perfect enough? Well, consider this. Salvation cannot be attained, but rather is a free gift. How many of you could climb that rope maybe two or three knots worth, maybe? I would die after the first one, you know, personally. But some people in good shape, they might be able to get maybe 20 knots high, but then you're a goner, you know? The fact is, is that we all fall short. Nobody's perfect enough. Uh, you need to be better today than yesterday. In fact, Joseph Fielding Smith put it this way. It's our duty to be better today than we were yesterday and better tomorrow than we were today. Why? Because we are on that road to perfection. My folks, it gets worse. Salvation does not come all at once. We are commanded to be perfect even as our Father in heaven is perfect. It will take us ages to accomplish this end, for there will be greater progress beyond the grave. It gets worse. Progress toward eternal life is a matter of achieving perfection. Living all the commandments guarantees total forgiveness of sins and assures one of exaltation through that perfection which comes by complying with the formula the Lord gave us. It leads to despair. The Mormon magazine, Ensign Magazine, puts it this way. Perhaps no idea creates more emotional stress for some of us than the idea that we need to be perfect right now or soon. And when we fail to achieve perfection in some area, we criticize ourselves harshly even to the point of despair. Are you starting to feel that despair based upon these comments? How would you like to earn salvation in this way? It leads to discouragement. Mormon Bishop Jeffrey Jacob put it this way, When I was a bishop, it was my privilege to counsel with many faithful members like Janet, who were struggling, often valiantly, to escape soul-destroying cycles of discouragement and despair that came when they failed to overcome their imperfections. There's no rest. I read a book written by Mormons, for Mormons, called Sanity Strategies for Everyday Mormons, and it says this, As soon as we believe it is possible for man to become God, we can really never rest for long and never say, Okay, my job is finished. My work is done. We must constantly push ourselves forward to greater and greater wisdom, greater and greater effectiveness. Man, I'm choking. I'm choking. This is way over my head at this point. Uh, full obedience is required. Spencer Kimball says, that transgressor is not fully repentant who neglects his tithing, 
misses his meetings, miss, uh, breaks the Sabbath, fails in his family prayers, does not sustain the authorities of the church, breaks the word of wisdom, etc. Oh man, that's tough. And you're accountable. Those who receive forgiveness and then repeat the same sin are held accountable for their former sins. Ooh, that's a tough one. That's a real tough one. Bible tells it truly, though. I mean, the Bible's got worse news than anything. There is no one who does good, not even one. Galatians 3.10, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. What does that mean? I'm cursed, you're cursed. Without Jesus, we're goners, okay? James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of it all. Now, it all comes down to this, folks. God's law impales us. It goes right through the heart. It shatters our self-righteousness. God's law is bad news. But you know what? The good news is that by believing in Jesus, you are made perfect forever. That is what Hebrews 10.14 teaches. By one sacrifice, he has made us perfect forever. And it's a completed action in the Greek. Nothing else has to happen. Jesus has done it all. It is a done deal. And all you have to do is to receive that done deal. You know, in Ephesians 2.8, this is about the third time that verse is snuck in here. It's by grace. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. There ain't nothing you can do to become perfect because Jesus provides you with all the perfection that you need. And oh, the joy. Oh, the joy of forgiveness. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And oh, the wonder of true forgiveness. I can testify to you right now, the joy of being forgiven. I will tell you right now, I am a redeemed sinner. I am a sinner. I know that I am a sinner. Did you know the more I grow in Christ, the more stuff I find wrong in my life? <laughs> What's going on? I am so appreciative of our great Savior. There is forgiveness in him. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more, he says. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. This is the glorious good news. Now here's the bad news right here. The H-bomb of God's law dooms us all. But God showers his grace on us with the free gift of salvation. Now what category are you in? Are you under the H-bomb right now? Or are you under the water of God's grace? It is my hope and prayer that every one of you are experiencing this living water, the water of God's grace that is showering down that free gift of salvation for all people. I'm sorry for going over. I just get carried away with myself sometimes. Uh, but, uh, but God bless you. God bless you. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word, which is a barometer of truth against which we can test all other truth claims. To you belongs all glory, our Father. We give all the glory to you for this entire weekend. And thank you, Lord, for this conference this weekend. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.